Um, yeah, we would like to welcome you all to our uh, short talk about uh, embedded limbo dancing with WebAssembly and how we uh, were able to, to bring WebAssembly to pretty tiny devices. And um, I would like to start with a short introduction. So first one is me without a beard. I'm with Siemens as a principal key expert um, for quite some time now, and I'm, I'm really interested in the Rust programming language and in WebAssembly, that's why I'm here. And uh, besides doing a lot of other stuff, I'm, I'm also active in the embedded special interest groups, which we started in June, I think, um, yeah, and bringing WebAssembly closer to embedded devices. Thank you, Dominic. I'm Keith Winstein. I'm a professor at Stanford University. I'm also one of the maintainers of the WebAssembly binary toolkit and the wasm to c tool. Yeah. So let me quickly start why we care and why we as Siemens do care. So um, you might know Siemens or might not know Siemens. We are kind of a huge company, uh, multinational, most of the headquarters in, in Germany. Um, just by coincidence, uh, Siemens was founded in the same year as this beautiful city where we are in today, in 1847, so 177 years ago. And to keep on track uh, over time, we are in a state of constant change, looking for uh, new technologies and um, how we can propel ourselves forwards and, and stay competitive. And one of the things we are doing right now, or our key mission right now, is to really bridge the gap or combine the real world where we all are living in and the digital world, uh, which represents the world we're living in. So the things we are living in, uh, how energy comes to your home, how buildings like this get lighted and um, air conditioned and so on and so forth. So if we really look close into the connection between the real world and the digital world, and we zoom in, we will find tangible devices. We call them field devices or even smart field devices if they are smart. So these are the things for really sensing and acting and interacting with our world. And when we look at these field devices, uh, we have a particular set of requirements when it comes to their behavior and applications especially when we talk about applications which can be changed during runtime. So first of, and for all, and, and it's pretty important for us that these applications run in a kind of sandbox environment. Um, so the application can only access the uh, peripherals or resources we grant them uh, to be accessed. And um, the applications can run in a robust manner. So let's take the example. I have a a uh, web server running uh, in a sandbox environment and now my web server crashes. I get a 404 or 500 or whatever. Not a problem because the control loop underneath, which is controlling airflow to a machine or something, still works without a web server, which is only need for configuration. And with a good sandboxing and abstraction, the next thing we achieve is portability. So I can take one kind of algorithm and put in another device. So as mentioned, we are, it's a huge company. We employ a lot of people there, but still we have better things to do than writing the same algorithm over and over again. So we want to take it from one board, put it to another. Talking about the vast amount of people we do have at the company, we have experts in certain domains all over the world um, who are used to different tool chains and different programming languages. So we want them to bring what they know and not learn this language imposed by the system they are running on. And again, with the people, so the devices we are building tend to have a pretty long time in the field. So we're talking here about several decades, devices being operated. So whatever technology we consider as a company needs to be standardized in a way that it can be updated or we can work with it 20 years from now. And it needs to be understandable because of this long runtime, we will have changing personnel taking maintenance of, of devices. So this is what, what we need from our um, runtimes for applications. And what we did as an exercise um, is to look where we can use what. So on the y-axis, you will see the um, yeah, complexity or size of devices uh, increasing. So um, Getting bigger usually means getting more expensive. You need more memory in. 
So we uh, took the amount of free memory for the application, which usually is very low because the devices are uh, optimized for their operation. And um, <clears throat> oh, thanks. Now let's try this. Um, yeah, so the amount of free memory, and on the x-axis you will see uh, we looked from an aspect of, of um, timing behavior of our, of our components. So on, on hard real time where we need very low jitter, we feel we are not yet there with WebAssembly, but looking at soft real time, so deterministic behavior, or even just fast behavior without determinism in it, we still have a viable um, use for let's say, um, um, sandbox applications. And so if you we, if we have a lot of memory in, we can just, just um, use containers, Linux containers as of today, as they are supported, as we are using them already. They can run in conjunction with, with WebAssembly, but if we take more and more memory away, it makes more and more sense to move our workloads to WebAssembly and at some point even get rid of Linux containers because they just cannot run anymore looking at the small devices. But also here we somehow uh, met a natural barrier or limit where, that, where we were at a point where we cannot go any lower. So if we talk about really a couple of kilobytes being free for new applications. And there we thought mm, maybe we could uh, find a ways to around the runtime or remove the runtime. And this actually is where we met Keith and, and uh, a uh, cool corporation started, and I would like to hand over to Keith. Thank you very much. So yeah, I think we just... We're not done. So, so I think I got in touch with the Siemens folks at the WebAssembly Community Group meeting in Munich, where they presented that slide. And it was an interesting, I think, difference of perspectives, because I think there is a point of view where WebAssembly is the next thing after Java with its VM, and .NET with its VM, and JavaScript with its VM, and there's these very sophisticated things that happen at runtime. Okay, very sophisticated things that happen at runtime, and I just don't see it that way. I have been working on this WASM to C transpiler for a while, which is part of the WebAssembly binary toolkit, which is maintained by the community group. And to me, WebAssembly is a very different kind of thing. It doesn't really have a VM at runtime. It has a minuscule, minimalist necessary runtime support. And so I think it is possible to do things with WebAssembly that you could not do with these much more heavyweight languages that require much more heavyweight support at runtime. So I want to tell you about this wasm to c tool and how we worked with the Siemens folks to try and produce the minimal possible binary version of a WebAssembly runtime that could run on these tiny embedded devices with small amounts of available memory. So just to take you through the pathway here, let's say someone writes some piece of code here in some original language. This could be C, it could be Go, it could be Rust, whatever you, you want to write in. This is C here, so there's some global variable, the state, and there's a setter, and there's a getter. This is code you could actually use. If you compile it, you don't even need the uh, WASI SDK. You could just, whatever comes with your Ubuntu is good enough. You can just run this command line, clang target equals WASM32. It ships with you know, Ubuntu GNU Linux. And if you display it, you will get this tiny thing. This is the whole output of a WebAssembly module that represents the compiled version of this. So I don't know if some of you have experience reading x86 assembly, but to me, this is infinitely more pleasant. There's a module here. There is a function exported as set that gets the parameter passed to it and stores it at location 0 in memory. And there's a different function called get that loads whatever is at location 0, a 32-bit number, and returns it. And that's it. It's so, it's, just, it's very simple. It's very simple. As, a, as an academic, you like to see it this simple. OK, so where does wasm to c come in? OK, so wasm to c takes the same module, this is the same thing I showed you before, and transpiles it into a C header file and a C implementation file. So the header file looks like this. This is the interface exposed by the compiled, or I should say the transpiled version of the module. There is a structure that represents the fields of the module, and then anything, and, and then there is a mechanism to instantiate and free it. So you could almost think of this like a class in C++. There's a class here, and then there's some public methods or member functions on it. Yeah, there's the memory was exported, the setter is exported, the getter is exported. So these are the, the public interface to this WebAssembly module. So this is what wasm to c creates. This is the header file, 
And let's see what the implementation looks like. Again, this was the original WebAssembly module. This is what the structure looks like. It, it, it looks very sane, at least I think so. So to instantiate it, there's a call to something in the runtime. So there is a runtime. It's not like totally free of runtime, but it's, it's like not really a virtual machine. It's a very simple thing. So WASM runtime allocate memory. There's a pointer. How many pages do you want? How big are the pages? I mean, this is pretty simple stuff. When you free it, it's like free. And then the setter says, OK, there's going to be parameter 0. What are we going to do? We're going to take parameter 0, assign it to in, uh, integer 1. We're going to take the number 0. That's the location assigned to integer 0. And we're going to store uh, at that location the content of that variable. And to load it, we're going to load from that location 0 into something called variable uh, 0, and we'll return it. So this is what the C code looks like. It's not that much bigger than the WebAssembly module. The runtime support is very lightweight. The, these WASMC generated modules link with this VMless runtime. The runtime has zero global mutable state. Every module is independent. And they link together according to the rules of the binary ABI. But there is not some registry of modules. It's not like, oh, I want to have a new module. Let me register it in all its types in some global store that needs to have a mutex around. None of that. There is no global mutable state. We're very proud of that. That's why I'm saying it so theatrically. But it was not easy. <laughs> there is no global mutable state. You can load and destroy modules at will, and it doesn't affect any global data structures or other modules. And yet, you can still link them together, and you still get type safety when they call each other. So the runtime support is very minimalist. You've got to be able to allocate memory. Um, you, you have to be able to be asked to grow memory. But as some of you will know, in WebAssembly, grow memory is optional. The runtime can always just say, I didn't feel like it. Um, but the, the, the call is there. And there's a free memory call. And that's sort of the flavor of it. It's not that much more than this. A memory structure is represented. You know, we have a pointer to the actual data. We got to know the page size at runtime. How many pages are there? How many bytes are there? Um, the maximum number of pages, is it a 64, memory 64, memory 32? But this is the representation of the runtime data structures of the WebAssembly runtime. It's a very minimalist thing. It's not like JVM. Uh, to actually use this module, you're going to have to write some code around it, like a main, you know, a main function that's going to have to actually declare an instance of this structure. If you're, you know, good, you're going to want to catch the traps. I mean, that's kind of the, the point. The safety is the point, so you should catch the traps. And then you're going to instantiate the instance, and that can that can trap. And then, you know, you just can just call these exported functions, call the the public methods on it. You can set, you can get whatever you want. This is what the sort of surrounding code looks like. But again, very very simple. The conformance with the WebAssembly specification is embodied in the generated.c file. So all of the guarantees that WebAssembly is trying to enforce are there in the output of the transpiler. So if you're worried about out-of-bounds memory access, you know, it's either going to reserve a 32-3-bit area of virtual memory so that no pointer can leak outside of it and use hardware to detect the traps, or you can software bounds check it. If you're worried about type safety of your indirect function calls, you know, there's a technique for that. There's a canonical 256-bit serialization of the function type, and then the linker compounds those. You can compare the pointer, or you can do an AVX comparison. Um, all of the guarantees of WebAssembly, all of the, the conformance with the specification, all the sandboxing, all the type safety, um, uh, and the determinism, the deterministic traps, is all embodied in that generated .c file. Um, we, you know, it supports the bulk memory operations proposal, the reference site proposal, the tail calls proposal, multi-memory, SIMD, memory 64, exception handling. We have the V3 version, which they're now calling legacy. We have a pull request pending for the V4. Custom page sizes, we have a uh, pull request pending. So we try to keep up with the specification. The big thing missing here, I think you'll notice, is garbage collection. We, we're just, we're not close to supporting that one. But it supports a lot of WebAssembly. Uh, we're here in the big feature matrix. You may have seen this on the WebAssembly homepage, Chrome, Firefox, Safari. Here's WASMC way over on the right. But, you know, we have a respectable, we're, we're, we try to keep up and, and, and really think of this as a valid WebAssembly engine. The main user of this right now is the Firefox build system. So if you use Firefox, the way that they link with libraries like libopus, which is an audio decoder, and libjpeg, um, which is obviously an image decoder, the way they link with these libraries is they take the library compile it to WebAssembly, then run that through WASM to C, and take the resulting C and throw that in the Firefox build tree and build it. And that gets them safety in case there's a buffer overflow in libopus, libjpeg, these things are isolated. Now, you could imagine, why don't they, I mean, in the actual browser, they use process isolation you know, for the tabs and these kinds of things. But this is so much more lightweight than that. The, the cost of crossing this boundary is like nanoseconds. It, it's an incredibly lightweight 
isolation mechanism. So that's our main user. Android is experimenting with this thing they call WASM NDK. The Zig build system uses a different thing they call WASM to C. There's a WASM to MicroPython. My research group is using WASM to C. Uh, the performance is really good. Instantiating a module is about how fast is your malloc typically. Invoking a function is like any function call, so incredibly fast across that boundary. The long-term compute throughput, if you, if you have a long routine, is typically around 85% of if you just compile the thing to native code. There, these are not serious benchmarks here, but in general, it's very good. He, you know, for just, here's WASM to C on this thing. Now, this is not quite the same WASM to C, but you know, comparing here's WASMers LVM backend, here's, here's WASMers crane lift backend, here's WASM time, here's Node.js, which is gonna be V8, here's WAS0. WASM to C is smoking all these things. It is the fastest way to run WebAssembly if you don't care about how long it takes to compile it to native. The reason they're not doing this, among the probably several reasons they're not doing this in the browser is because in the browser you don't want to sit there while LVM cranks and compiles something. But if you can afford to compile it ahead of time, it's very, very, very fast to do it that way. These are not rigorous benchmarks. Okay, so the question is what can we do for people like Siemens that want to have incredibly tiny run times because you're on an incredibly constrained device. You can't run you know, V8 on there. Uh, you probably can't even run Whammer on there. So Dominic gave me this minimal WASM routine which calculates the temperature of a device under forced convection, hypothetically. This is the routine, and we're gonna do a demo. All right, so here is Dominic's function that he sent me. It's a C function, it was written by scientists or smart people like that. We are gonna compile that to WebAssembly. Now this is just the normal Ubuntu Clang. It came with my operating system. I did not even install the WASM SDK. It's just the normal Clang, we compile it. And we can look at it. We can, was, you know, we can take it from the binary format to the text format. Um, so we can put it in a text format. And if you look at it here, it is not complicated. This is the assembly. But it's, it's, it's very comprehensible. This is the assembly, there's this routine here, the function zero, which is exported as calc temperature, and it, you know, it takes in these three parameters, returns a parameter about airflow, this is the computation. So if we wanna make this as small as possible, the first thing I would observe is that although LLVM compiled this with a memory, it never uses that memory. All of the computation here is happening on, this, on the WASM stack. So in a future version of LLVM, we would hope that it would realize that and not even declare the memory. But here, I'm just gonna YOLO it. We'll just kill that. Nothing bad is gonna happen. WebAssembly, it's safe. It's like the liberty, the freedom that comes from having a safety net. We're just gonna YOLO that like that. And nothing bad's gonna happen. And then we'll just go back to the binary format um, let's see, we'll take it from calctemp.wat to calctemp.wasm. Boom, we're done. And by the way, how big is this thing? It's 80 bytes. 80 bytes! It's, it's so beautiful and simple. Okay, I think hopefully that can fit on the embedded device. Okay, we got it on there. So now we're going to convert it to C. So we're going to wasm to C it. calctemp.wasm.o, calctemp w to C, dot C, and boom. Now we have a header file that represents the interface to this WebAssembly module exposed through a C API. So we have the actual module which had nothing in it because there was no persistent state, uh, but there's the actual calc temperature method, you could say, public method or member function uh, that takes those three parameters and returns another parameter. Um, we can look at the actual C if you want. It's not gonna be that interesting. Let's see, Here, here's the actual implementation of the function. So let us just build this with the runtime. We're gonna build the WebAssembly module linked together with a WebAssembly runtime, a fully conforming WebAssembly runtime. We're gonna build them together. Um, and there's some subtleties here. For, you know, we, we've, we've decided that our strategy for enforcing the out-of-bounds checking of WebAssembly is not gonna be to allocate 33 bits of virtual memory. We're gonna do it in software. So there's a runtime cost that every load and store, if there were any load and stores, would be software bounds checked. But in this case, it didn't use the memory at all. And by the way, how big is this thing? This is an entire WebAssembly runtime plus this particular WebAssembly module. It is 2,376 bytes. It's just over two kibibytes. Oh, there's a question, yes. 
Oh, yeah, I think so. I think the C compiler is pretty. The question was, does any of the runtime that doesn't get used get included in this object file? And I, I, ho I certainly hope not. I mean, the Clang is a very sophisticated compiler, and I think it's pretty good about omitting the functions that, it, that are not being used here. So yeah, it, it's, it's, um, we're, we're doing all the tricks we can here to get this thing as small as possible. Uh, so if we wanted to use this, um, we would take you know, a, a main routine like I showed you before. You know, we just take these arguments from the command line, and we catch the trap, and we call the thing. So if we compile that, we'll just GCC it. Do, do, do with our object that has the entire WebAssembly runtime. What? Oh, I typoed it. Uh, oh, no. Great. We run it, and I don't know, let's take a input temp 34, 35, airspeed 36. Asset temperature is 48 degrees Celsius. I feel good. I feel good. All right, thank you. Now you may say, well, that's not very satisfying because this thing didn't use a memory at all. You just deleted the memory. That doesn't really feel right. And by deleting the memory, it also meant you didn't have to ever malloc or have any of these routines in there. So okay, we can do better. What if you actually want to use the memory? We're going to show another program here, which is a long-term moving average filter. So some scientist or mathematician wrote this program to do a moving average over the last eight floating point numbers. So we have some static variable that's an array of eight floats and some index, and every time you get in a new float, you put it in this array, and then you average over the whole array, the moving average, boxcar average of the last eight, you return the average. Okay, now this is definitely gonna use the memory because the compiler is gonna put those eight floats or that array in memory. So let's see what happens here. So we're gonna, if we compile this program, we get a filter.wasm, and we can look at it in the binary format. Uh, so here, you know, we can see lots of loads and stores and these kinds of things. It's definitely using the memory. But how much memory has LLVM procured for this program? It has procured 128 kibibytes. 128 kibibytes. That is more than it needs to store these eight floats. Now, a future version of LLVM will be much more parsimonious in allocating memory for its modules. But that doesn't exist yet, so we're going to do it ourselves. Instead of giving this two pages of 64 kibibytes each, we're going to give it 36 bytes using the brand new custom page sizes WebAssembly feature that just uh, went to phase two, I guess at this point a few months ago. So we're not going to give it 128,000 bytes. We're going to give it 36 bytes, 36 pages with a page size of one. All right? And hopefully that will happen automatically. Okay, so now let's just go back to the binary format. Ah, there we go. And then we will turn it into C. Um, we can look at the C if you want. It's gonna be very similar as before, but now there's actually a memory as a member of this structure. Uh, and we still have this moving average method that's exposed on that, and that's going to touch the memory. But the memory is 36 bytes at maximum. All right, so if we build this thing and we run it, we, ah, it's got 36 bytes. We can start putting in some numbers, and we'll see if the moving average converges to the number I'm giving. It does. It does. What happens if we give it not enough memory? What's going to happen? We gave it 36 bytes. Should we, should we give it 35 bytes? How many bytes should we give it? 18. 18. Okay, I don't think you can store eight 32-bit floating point numbers in 18 bytes, but we'll, we're going to find out. All right, so we did that. We're going to take it back to WASM, and then we're going to take it back to WASM to C, and then we're going to build it, and then we're going to run it. Oh, no! A safe trap occurred. It didn't seg fault. It just gave me a very friendly message that a safe trap occurred. And again, these things are in kilobytes, the entire runtime. Now, this is more kilobytes. I think this one comes out to like five or six kilobytes because we have a malloc in there. Um, we might be able to get it smaller. But the, the bottom line here is that I want you to think about WebAssembly 
as not something comparable to Java VM or JavaScript VM or these kinds of things. It's an incredibly lightweight thing where you can be talking about double digit numbers of bytes and the runtime support is in single digit numbers of kilobytes. Back to you, Dominic. Thank you, Keith. And um, yeah, thanks, it's, it's awesome. And thanks for the live demo. And <clears throat> so the, the good thing about engineering is that whenever you solve a problem, there's a new one. So now we have a new problem. So we have everything in C, super tiny, small. But how do I update my module now? Because I, when we look at these super tiny devices, usually my delivery is a single binary containing both support package, operating system, and all the applications. So I change a single line of code. I need to do a full update, full firmware update, which is expensive in, in uh, terms of the process I need to do. I need to inform my customers. I have a change log. I need to do software clearing, whatever I, my company needs to do to have a firmware update just for a single line of code. And to be fair, actually, this hinders us to have fast feedback from our customers because we accumulate a lot of single line of codes to a bigger release to uh, take the pain of doing a release. It's also expensive in, in terms of the actual firmware update. So it takes energy out of my system if it's battery powered. It takes bandwidth from my network. It takes computation power out of my device, which I can use for other stuff. So usually I don't have spare computation power around. So what, what we are doing, one possible solution here is um, we have uh, tried Cepha operating system on these, a rhythm operating system on these tiny devices and use a feature called LLX. So your next question might be, LL what? So let me do a, 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 co a short sidebar. So LLX, it's, it's the abbreviation for uh, linkable, linkable load, loadable extensions. It has been introduced uh, roughly a year ago in Cepha and, and what it does in a, in a couple of steps. So you have super complicated code as, a, as shown here. You do some magic macro to export the symbol to actually um, make your host system able to call your function. You compile it into a rel relocatable uh, ELF binary file and then you put it in your running system without a reboot, just put it in, load it, link it, and then execute how often you want it. And then if you don't need the module anymore, you can even free the resources by unloading the module. So if a very dynamic way now to change your stuff. Um, coming back to my example, so we have an arbitrary asset and we want to know the temperature. We want to know how the temperature behaves and how the asset behaves. Maybe did use some information about the state of lubrication if, and, and give some maintenance um, propositions here. So we have a forced convection and we know the speed of the air coming in, the temperature and the temperature coming out. So as I mentioned, we have a lot of bright people in, in, in the company and they provide an algorithm to take these three values and get to a really good uh, asset, real asset temperature there. But they come from different domains and they, they are proficient in Rust or C and Zig. So they, they wrote in any of these three algorithms, uh, languages I have the algorithm in. And from here, it's just standard, as, as Keith showed, it's just standard way. We put it through the uh, um, WebAssembly um, to, to generate the WebAssembly bytecode. Then we just throw it to the VASM to see and generate the LLX module of it. Some, again, some shim around to do the link to the host system. And so what's left for us now is to just zip and send it. So the module keys showed when we zip it, we can even half it. So we would have like around 1.2 kilobytes to send over the wire to do a change of behavior of our system here. And this is how it would look like. So I have, a, I have just used an arbitrary STM discovery board on my desk. I, I left it at home because I was in the plane. And you can see the three modules loaded from three different languages. And, I, and when I invoke them, I get the asset temperature and the language which the algorithm has been um, uh, programmed in. And then I unload the module again at the end. And so with this, we would like to summarize quickly. So, um, yeah. all right. What's our summary? WebAssembly is awesome. The runtime overhead can be very small. It can be single digit kilobytes. Um, the custom page sizes extension is very exciting and it allows you to make the memory even like very small numbers of bytes. You're not limited to these 64 kilobyte pages. 
the best way to ship WebAssembly modules around might be to pre-compile them to a, a very concise object file, gzip that object file, email it around, and just link to it somewhere else, it, rather than trying to send WebAssembly around and have a WebAssembly runtime running on your device. Uh, and you can do all this without sa uh, sac sacrificing all of the safety and uh, nice determinism properties of WebAssembly. So I think we'll end there and take your questions. Yes. Thanks. Any questions? Yes. There's, there's a mic coming. Oh, sorry. Microphone. Have we tested it on a chip yet? So, so the, the short demo I, I skipped. It yeah, it's, it's an um, STM32F429. Uh, yes, how about there on the aisle? No, okay, how about the other aisle? So I saw that you're using Zephyr RTOS. Yeah. Uh, is there already a WASM runtime like WAMR that is running on Zephyr and that yeah. has been tested so that uh, maybe this is, and how does it work with the over the air updates? And maybe this is also one of the approaches that is different, but uh, yeah. I'm just wondering if there is already something. Yeah, so, so there's this, Vemma is the runtime to go here and um, it's, it's in Zephyr and we could use it. But again, then we would have the overhead of the real runtime, and so if you c if you can afford the the memory, then it could be a way for you. Yeah. It will just be slower and bigger. But other than that, Whammer is great. Yeah. Right. Other questions? Just one. Hi there. This is a question relating to translational correctness and the final stage from the WASM into. Uh, from C in the compilation of that. So in that stage, um, is it proven that the WASM 2C will not generate a chunk of C code that contains references to potentially undefined behavior as discovered for optimizations within LLM? I, I don't know that any WebAssembly runtime, uh, including um, you know, Conrad's work has been formally proven to the level you're talking about. So I, I think the answer would be no for all of them. Um, and, and if you're concerned that C may be more, would, would value the proof more than some of the other people, I share your concern. But I don't think anyone has proved that kind of thing about any WebAssembly runtime. I'm more, con more interested in the differences in semantics around corner cases in C compared with WebAssembly, but we could have a chat I, later. <laughs> yeah, I would say the one that has been the most vexing for us has not been exactly a safety property, but a determinism property. You know, WebAssembly requires that if there's a load operation that's out of bounds, it, even if the result of that load is never observed by anyone, you cannot optimize that out uh, because the load operation has to call a trap right at that moment. Uh, and so, you know, plumbing that through C and a, and a C compiler was annoying a, a, and came with more of a performance impact to get that guarantee than we would have liked. Yes, and then I think we'll, well maybe one more question after you. So a dynamic determinism effect, the linking abstract, was that because of the component specification with WebAssembly or was that something you had to implement with two? Oh, thank you. The linking that he described? The, li uh, the live linking? Uh, sorry, yes, yeah, so it was the live the li the linking that you described. Was that because of the WebAssembly itself, or was that something you implemented on Zephyr? Yes, so the necessity is because on, on these super tiny devices, everything is, is has hard addresses, fixed addresses, and so we usually, it's pretty hard to, to dynamically load stuff. And so we, we just looked at a way how to basically just update the module, because usually you would, any line of code would need a full update. So this is, yeah, yeah. So we have considered and started the embedded special interest group, uh, not because of that, but, but maybe one of the reasons. So it's not applicable everywhere, let's put it out there. All right, is there one final question? Okay, uh, you, you're in the front row, last word. I think the custom page size people are pretty eager to have it supported through the whole tool chain. So um, my understanding is that there's a, a 
pretty broad base of interest for that to happen. But I mean, you, you have generally have channels into their, you know, they're, they're listening and they're interested in general what you're saying. I, I mean, it's not hard to join these groups. Like the WASM CG is a pretty open community and you can hang out with the custom page size people and they're, they're all talking about this kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're doing it. Cool. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you again. Thanks.